Hey everyone, this is Pastor Todd and Miss Daphne. We pastor Transformation Church here in Seminole, Texas, and I believe that this message is going to be a blessing to you. Our vision is to transform lives and change the world. We want to invite you to join us online or in person Sundays at 10.30 a.m. or Wednesdays at 7 p.m. We hope to see you there. Hallelujah. Well, today's a special day. It's our fifth Sunday. We're going to take up a special offering here in just a moment for our church and specifically to eliminate the debt in our church. Can I get an amen? amen. So turn over to your, in your Bibles to Joshua chapter 24, verse number 15. For the past several weeks, we've been talking about this topic called simply this, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Amen. And uh, Joshua chapter 24, verse number 15 The Bible says this, and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your father, uh, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let's say that together. Ready? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Do you believe that today? And notice something here. Joshua basically said this, you have to choose. And I've said this many times and I'll continue to say this. I believe the greatest gift that God's ever given us isn't necessarily Jesus, though Jesus is the greatest gift of all. But the greatest gift really that goes past Jesus is the choice to choose him. Because not everybody chooses Jesus. So really the most powerful, the most important gift that God gave us is the power to choose. And proof of that is in the Garden of Eden whenever he put the tree of good and evil in there and said, don't eat of it. And it was a choice for Adam and Eve to not eat of the tree of good and evil. Amen. So I believe that when that was placed in the Garden of Eden, God also put within human beings this ability to choose him. Why? Because God wants us to choose him. Turn over to Colossians chapter 1, verse number 13. And specifically... I want to focus on this phrase, we will serve the Lord. Well, the big question is, is how do we serve the Lord? And we've been talking about that. And there's all kinds of generic ways that we serve the Lord through prayer, through giving, through coming to church, being nice to people, you know, not running people off the road whenever they run you off the road, all that kind of, all that stuff is good stuff. Amen. Though the opportunities might rise even more as Seminole and Gaines County continues to ride and all these Crazy people are moving into Gaines County. I mean, we got to walk in love with all the crazies out there. Look, your neighbor say, he's talking to you. Go on, just say, he's talking to you right now. Colossians chapter 1, verse number 13. We serve the Lord by and through his kingdom. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. We were once in darkness when we accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. We entered into his kingdom. And a kingdom is a different way of doing things. See, there's the kingdom of the world, and there's the kingdom of God. When we were born again, we entered into a new kingdom, God's kingdom, and we exited or we came out of the kingdom of of darkness. Now turn over to Luke chapter 17, verse number 20. I'm doing a brief review to get everybody on the same page today, and then we'll go forward. Luke chapter 17, verse number 20. And when he had and, and when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, See here or see there. Notice what Jesus said, Luke chapter 17, verse 21. For indeed, The kingdom of God is within you. So obviously those that were that were listening, the Pharisees specifically, they're thinking that that Jesus was going to come back and put a you know great big whooping on the Roman government and take over, and then the Jewish nation would be revived and they would take over the world. But how many know Jesus had a bigger idea than just the Jewish nation taking over the world at that time? He was thinking of me and you. He was thinking of us. He knew that he would have to go to Calvary, down the cross, arose again on the third day so we could have this eternal life in Christ Jesus. So that's why he said, nor will they say, see here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. So the kingdom of God is not something that you just, you just kind of like move from one city to another. No, the kingdom of God is a spiritual place inside of us. It's a spiritual way of doing things on the inside of us. And whenever we tap into the things of the spirit, it changes things in the natural. Turn over to Matthew chapter 6, verse 31. 
Matthew chapter 6, verse 31. Again, the kingdom of God is on the inside of every believer. And we serve the Lord by and through this kingdom. Because we've been given the kingdom of God, we must honor God's kingdom within us. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 31. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink or what shall we wear? For after these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Notice Jesus put things in to priority. And even Christians, we all have fallen into this situation where we worry about what we're wearing. We're worrying about what we eat. We're worrying about the bills. We're worried about inflation. We're worried about the taxes. We're worried about this and this and this. And Jesus said, within the kingdom of God, which is inside of you, you don't have to worry about any of those things. God's going to take care of you as long as you put him first. When you put God first in everything that we do, then the worry, the doubt, the anxiety of what we're going to eat, what we're going to wear, how we're going to handle the economy, how we're going to do this, how we're going to pay this bill, all of the worry and anxiety leaves because when we put Him first and we honor Him as the King of the kingdom, then He's promised us all these things shall be added to you. Now, how many know God cannot lie? Come on, anybody. How many know God cannot lie? If he said, I'm going to add these things to you, you can, you can guarantee, guarantee, you can guarantee that God's going to come through. Amen. Because he cannot lie. He, he, he will accomplish everything that he sent his word to do. See, putting God's kingdom first is how we honor God's kingdom. It's a matter of obedience. It's a matter of honor. To seek first means to, the most important thing in our lives is to worship and desire God and his kingdom. And we honor God by doing this. Now turn over to John chapter 5, verse number 23. And again, this is just a review. This is what we've talked about thus far in this series. Let's define honor. We talked about this last Sunday. John chapter 5, verse 23. That all should honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. If we're to look up this word honor in the Greek, it means to prize. It means to put a value on or fix a value on it. To make someone or something valuable to revere. And it's so important for us as believers to not ta take this thing called Jesus Christianity for granted that we forget to add value and to honor the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It's easy for us to know all the principles of the Bible, but not to live by the Bible. It's important for us to know not only just how to pray, but to have an intimate relationship with our Father when we communicate with Him. It's more than going through the religious activities thinking that we're pleasing Him, but it's actually a, a, it's, it's more for us as believers to honor Him because it's from the heart and it's not from the head or from a natural thing that we do what we call Christianity. Now you're there in John, turn over to Mark, make a left-hand turn, Mark chapter 7, verse number 6. Let's continue to talk about this. And I'm laying a foundation. Y'all still with me today? Yes. Look at your neighbor and say, wake up. Yes. Come on, the Cowboys don't play today, so we're good. <laughs> Anyways, Mark chapter 7, verse number 6. And he answered and said to them, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? You know, Jesus was straight to the point, straight up, calling him a hypocrite. As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Notice they said this, the people honor me with their lips, but their heart is from, far from me. Basically, the religious people were using lip service is what I call, but they weren't connecting with their hearts. It's easy to serve God because it makes you look good, but are you serving God from your heart? And that's ultimately what God wants. He wants a heart more than a lip service. We honor God because honor is an issue of the heart. Now, if you, if you missed any of the services, I encourage you to go back to YouTube and all that and watch these services because today this is where I wanted to get to. So y'all ready today? Turn to Matthew chapter 6. Praise the Lord. Matthew 6 verse number 19. Honor is revealed through obedience and generosity. Let me say that again. Honor is revealed through obedience and generosity. And one of the things that Jesus wants of us as believers is more than just loving him, but honoring him. Matthew chapter 6, verse number 19. 
Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Notice verse 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let me say that again. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So Jesus was basically connecting our hearts to our treasure. And here we know that this treasure is something that's very important to the people he was talking to. And really you can determine what's important to you and what you honor in your life by basically three things. Your time, your talent, and your wealth. Your time, your talent, and your wealth. And those are the treasures of our lives. Your time, your treasure, or your time, your talent, and your wealth. I can look at your checkbook, I can look at your, your schedule, and I can tell you what's valuable to you by those things. Amen. So whenever we say seek first the kingdom of God, those three things, time, talent, and wealth, should be placed first in the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Y'all need to just stop running right now. You're getting so excited about this, I can already tell. But how many know God, God's all about... Uh, getting a blessing to us, but there's certain ways that he has already established in time for us to tap into those blessings. And obviously here when Jesus said, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, he was talking about the very issues of our lives, the very things that, that make us go forward, the very things that, that encourage us. Now when he said, for where your treasure is, there where your heart will be also, he's basically talking about where you put your things, where you put your time, talent, and wealth into, that is what's valuable to you. Be careful of what you're honoring in that process. Now turn over to Matthew chapter 19, verse number 16. Let me give you an example of this. How, to, to, uh, how honor is revealed through obedience and generosity. Matthew chapter 19, verse number 16. Now today, I'm going to give a lot of scriptures. How many are thankful for that? It's not going to be an opinionated message tonight. We're gonna give you, I'm going to give you the word today. Come on, let your neighbor say, he's going to give you the word today. I'm going to lay such a scriptural foundation for what's about to happen that it's going to transform your life. You can't walk out of this place, so I don't, I don't see it in the word. You're going to see it in the word today. Now, what you do with this between you and Jesus, but I'm going to give you the word today. Amen. Matthew chapter 19, verse 16. Now, behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Verse 18. He said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear, wit bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept from my youth, what do I still lack? Now, how many know that's pretty good? How many know that's pretty good for this young man to, he hasn't murdered, he hasn't committed adultery, he hasn't stealed, he hasn't lied, he's honored his father and mother, he's loved his neighbors, and he's like, man, all these things, man, I've done these, Lord, but what else, what else? And Jesus said this, verse 21, I mean, oh, Jesus knows how to get in your face. He said this, he said this to him, if you want to be perfect, or another way of saying this, if you want to grow up, go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure, somebody say treasure, treasure, treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So he had done all these amazing things. He had lined himself up with the Word of God. But there was one area that Jesus knew that if he could get this young man to uh, humble himself and be obedient to this one area, then the windows of heaven would be open. I mean, there would be a, a tremendous amount of growth in his life. But we notice something here. He said, if you want to be perfect, if you want to grow, if you want to be mature, go and sell and, and all that you have and give to the poor. Now, I mean, oh, Jesus wasn't necessarily saying sell and everything out. He was basically pointing to the fact that the time, his talent, and his wealth was where his heart was at. And he's saying, give that all to me. And then he goes on, and you will have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. See, this word treasure, it actually means in the Greek, it means a place to deposit wealth. A place in which good and precious things are collected and laid up. 
See, his heart was connected to his stuff. Can I get an amen in this place? His heart was connected to his stuff so much that it hindered him from growing as a Christian. Oh, let me say that again. I'll let that kind of get inside of your heart. His heart was so connected to his stuff so much that it hindered him from growing as a Christian. He hit a plateau in his walk with the Lord. He'd done all these amazing things for the Lord, but when it came to generosity, it capped. When it came to giving, when it came to give up his treasure, when it came to, to give up his stuff, he said, well, we know, obviously, it was too much for him. He walked away. He did all these great things, but what God was looking for is that one thing. Come on, somebody. You can do a lot of great things for the kingdom, but there's that one thing that God's really looking for, and that's what we as believers have got to humble ourselves and honor him and even give him that one thing. See, many Christians, and I've seen this many times as pastors, many Christians stop growing spiritually because they stop being generous. And it gets real quiet up in here. Many Christians stop growing spiritually because they, they stop being generous. Whatever reasons, and there's all kinds of reasons why generosity stops in the economy or you got something coming up and all those kind of things. And I've seen it that where your treasure is, your heart is also, whenever they stop giving as much, when they stop being generous in the church or around helping other people and they start hoarding it to themselves, then they stop growing spiritually. Amen. And proof of that is this rich young ruler. He, he, he had a lot of stuff, and he wasn't willing to give us up. He walked away from Jesus. He still did all these great, amazing things, but he didn't accept the fact that he needed to be generous. Look at your neighbor and say, I know you're generous. Find somebody else around you and say, I know you're generous. Generosity, if you're taking notes, write this down. Generosity connects us to miracles and supernatural provision. Let me say that again. Generosity connects us to miracles and supernatural provision. Selfishness is not in the kingdom of God. Amen. Let me say that again. Selfishness is not in the kingdom of God. Generosity is in the kingdom of God. And we've been delivered out of the kingdom of darkness into a new kingdom. Generosity is the new kingdom that we operate in, not selfishness. Turn over to 1 Kings chapter 17, verse number 8. Generosity connects us to miracles and supernatural provision. In 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 8, let me help you guys. Um, it, it comes before 2 Kings. I know it's an old joke. I, yeah, nobody, there's only a couple people left on that one. Anyways, 1 Kings chapter 17, look at verse number 8. I'm going to read for the New Living's translation. Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go and live in the village of Zarephath near the city of Sidon. I have instructed a widow there to feed you. So he went to Zarephath. As he arrived at the gate, gates of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks. And he asked her, would you please bring me a little water in a cup? As she was going to get it, he called, to, he called her, bring me a bite of bread also. So she said, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house. And I have only a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of a jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal, and then my son and I will die. How I many you know that is pretty desperate times? Verse number 13. But Elijah said to her, do not be afraid. Look at your neighbor and say, do not be afraid. Find some of around you and say, do not be afraid. Go ahead and do just what you've said. But make a little bread for me first. Notice what the prophet said. But make a little bread for me first. Somebody say first. First. Then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. Now right there, that instruction gave her a choice. She could have chose to not do what the man of God said. Or we could say chose not to do what the word of God said. Or she could choose to be obedient to God's word. Notice this, verse 14. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. There will always, somebody say always. There will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and crops grow again. So she did as Elijah said. Hallelujah. How many know she chose right? So she did as Elijah said, and she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. 
There was always, somebody say always. always. There was always enough flour and olive oil left in the containers just as the Lord had promised through Elijah. Notice the word of the Lord came in the midst of a difficult time of famine and poverty in her life. She was basically about to make her last meal and die. But the prophet, uh, the prophet Elijah comes and basically says, hold up, I got, a, I got a word from the Lord for you. And the Lord says, if you give that, that bread and that cup of water to me first, God's going to provide for many, many days after this. But he started by simply saying this, don't be afraid. This is the reason why a lot of people don't tap into generosity. Fear. They're afraid that if they start becoming generous, they won't have enough. But she was at a place in her life to where she was like, you know what? What else do I have to lose? I'm going broke anyway. I mean, we got nothing left. I might as well just do what the Lord said to do. And guess what? Because of her obedience and her honor to the word of the Lord, then there was always, somebody say always. There was always flour and olive oil left in the container. She had plenty because of her obedience to honor the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. So what does that mean? It basically means this. Generosity connects us to miracles and supernatural provision. If you become selfish and withhold, then poverty is going to come upon you. Let me give you some other examples of supernatural provision throughout the Bible. In Exodus chapter 16, we find that there was manna in the wilderness. God provided manna to the Israelites daily in the desert for 40 years. Then there was the happening that took place wherever, um, whenever um, God gave water to the Israelites in the desert when Moses struck a rock and water miraculously flowed out of that. That was in Exodus chapter 17, 1 through 7. And then we know that Elijah was fed by the ravens in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 26. There was a drought. Ravens brought Elijah bread and meat while he stayed in the brook of Cherith. Hallelujah. It's not only that. Elisha and the widow's oil in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1 through 7. Elijah instructed a widow to pour her small amount of oil into borrowed jars. Let me stress this word, borrowed jars. And the oil miraculously multiplied, which in turn paid off her debts. Hallelujah. I mean, like the seats and debts paid off. Hallelujah. It's all about obedience, all about honoring, being generous. And then we know that there was, a, a, in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 42, there was a feeding of 100 men. And a man brought Elijah 20 loaves of barley bread, and Elisha miraculously multiplied the bread to feed 100 men with leftovers remaining. Type of shadow of what was about to happen in the New Testament. Jesus' first miracle was a miracle of provision. In John chapter 2, verse number 1 through 11, at a wedding in Canaan, Jesus watered, or Jesus turned water into wine when the host ran out, providing the best for the last. Hallelujah. That's how he likes to operate. And then we know that Jesus fed the 5,000 men. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 13, Jesus multiplied the five loaves with bread and two fish and fed over 5,000 5, people with 12 baskets left over. Woo! And then, you know what, this is what a lot of people don't realize, but he did it again. Look at your neighbor and say, he did it again. He fed 4,000 people in Matthew chapter 15, verse 32. Jesus again performed a miracle by multiplying seven loaves and a few small fish to feed 4,000 people, and there were seven baskets of leftovers. How many know there is supernatural provision Miracles take place, hallelujah, when we choose to be generous, when we choose to honor God. Hallelujah. How many like to see some miracles happen in your finances? Hallelujah. It's all about being generous. It's the way God does things in his kingdom. Generosity is how we honor God. Let me give you an example of this with King David. How many know King David was a man after God's own heart? In 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse number 2, then King David rose to his feet and said, Hear me, my brethren and my people. I had it in my heart. Let me say it again. I had it in my heart to build a house for, of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord and for the footstool of our God and have made preparations to build it. See, David, King David had prepared to build a house for the Lord, for the ark of the covenant, but he had it in his heart to do it. Now, we know that he couldn't do that because he, the Bible says he had blood on his hands because he committed murder. And I don't want to go into all of that. With, uh, with Well, it's just a long story. But uh, you, you guys know the story. But Solomon rose up and um, built a temple. But let me 
stress this part. He gave huge amounts. King David gave huge amounts of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, precious stones, and other materials. In fact, First Chronicles chapter 29, verse number 3 says this, Moreover, because I have set my um, uh, affection on the house of my God. How many love the house of God? Woo. I have given to the house of my God over and above all that I had prepared for the holy house and my own special treasure of gold and silver. Hallelujah. He gave huge amounts, and he put it in his heart to want to give to the house of the Lord. In fact, he encourages, he encouraged others, his leaders, to give. David's generosity inspired the leaders of Israel and the people to give willingly towards the construction of this temple. 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse number 6 says, then the leaders of the father's houses, leaders of the tribes of Israel, the captains of thousands and of hundreds, with the officers over the king's works, offered willingly. Hallelujah. It is recorded that the leaders of the tribes of Israel and officers also gave large amounts of gold, silver, bronze, and other materials for the temple's construction. And notice during this whole process, God not once said, stop giving. In this process right here. Why? Because God loves generosity. God loves it when people are generous to the kingdom of God. It's a part of how he does things. Now, I did some research on David's and his leadership's offering to build the temple. How many like to know what we're talking about here? Check this out. David's personal contribution to this building project was 300, or excuse me, 3,000 talents of gold. And it was gold from um, Ophar. Sounds funny, but that Ophar is basically of its, it's known, the gold is known for its purity. So it wasn't just gold, it was pure of the purest gold. And he gave also 7,000 talents of refined silver. The contributions of the leaders, they gave 5,000 talents of gold, 10,000 talents of silver, 18 talents of bronze, and 100 talents, 100,000 talents of iron. Now you're thinking, well, talents, what are you talking about talents? Well, Gold, total in talents back then, 8,000 talents, 3,000 from David, 5,000 from his leaders. Silver was 17,000 talents, 7,000 from David, 10,000 from the leaders. Bronze, 18,000 talents, 100,000 talents of iron. Now, if you were to estimate all this, I said all these numbers. If you're a number person, I did that just for you. <laughs> but check this out. So if you were to do that in today's estimating of modern terms, in today's kind of economy, which fluctuates a lot, one talent of gold is approximately 75 pounds. That's a lot. That's a lot. You said it. Or it's 34 kilograms. One talent of silver is about 75 pounds, 34 kilograms. A rough estimate, y'all ready for this? A rough estimate of these contributions in today's terms depend, again, on the gold and silver prices. Gold at around 60,000 um, dollars per kilogram by 8,000 talents or 272,000 kilograms would equal, y'all ready for this? You're like, would you just get to the total? I am. <laughs> $16.3 billion. Billion. Look at your neighbor and say, billion. Not million. Not hundreds of thousands. Billion. When you start giving that much, you talk like, you billion. Like something hits you. And says, a billion. <laughs> 16.3 billion. That's what they, that was back in the day. Notice, not once did God say, don't give that much. Silver, check this out, at around $750 per kilogram, 17,000 talents or 578,000 kilograms would equal about, check this out, this isn't silver, $433 million in silver. Yo! Hallelujah. Just give me one million, Lord. <laughs> Man, give me a couple million. Lord. Give me, give me 2.4 million. We take care of that debt. Right? I mean, David, and, I mean, they just billions. And again, let me stress this. God not once says, stop, don't give. You know, I want you guys to stay poor. You got to stay humble. You know, got to be poor. To be, no, not one. God, God, God said that King David was a man after his own heart. And why? Because he was generous. Now, how many know God is generous? See, what David's and the leaders gave in gold and silver alone would be valued in the billions of dollars today. Look, you know, we say billions. 
Some of you guys are like, I ain't going there. Can't do it. This does not include the huge amounts of bronze and iron that was given, nor the precious stones and other materials. Now, how many know they were generous? See, why? Because generosity is how we allow God to move in our lives. Generosity is a kingdom principle. Generosity is how we honor God. In fact, generosity is, is how we, we, we operate not only in His kingdom, but should be a lifestyle of us. We shouldn't be hoarding. We should be giving. And how many you know, let me just kind of stress this, To we don't believe in hot checks. We don't believe in faith checks. They're hot checks. It's against the law. Now, let me explain something here to you also on this. Turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse number 1. 2 Corinthians 8, verse number 1. Generosity is not necessarily always measured by an amount. It's measured by the heart. Hallelujah. Even though King David and all his leaders had bukus of money, they were still generous because they had bukus of money. Amen. Now, there's a situation that happened in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse number 1. Let me tie this together. See, generosity is from the heart, and it's not based on natural circumstances. Let me say that again. Generosity must be from the heart and not based on natural circumstances. Let me give you an example of this. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse number 1. Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God. Notice the grace of God. Bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Now he's talking about today's times, not Old Testament, but New Testament. The churches of Macedonia. That in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty. Notice, even in the midst of their poverty, they still had joy. joy. Hallelujah. Now, abounded in the riches of their liberality. Notice they didn't allow the natural circumstances to keep them from being generous. And he goes on and explains this a little bit more. Verse number 3. This is Paul talking. He said, For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing. Hallelujah. Imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And not only as we have hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord. How many know that's how you honor the Lord? First to the Lord, and then to us by the will of God. So we urged Titus that he had that as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. Verse seven. But as you abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all diligence, and in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. Abound. What is this grace? This grace called giving, being generous. I've heard this many times over the years. You know, we're not underneath the law. We're under grace, and we don't have to tithe anymore. I disagree with that, obviously, because Jesus said to tithe in the Gospels. But let me just say this. If you do believe that, then you should want to give more than your 10%. Because grace should abound. You should want to give more than 10%. If you're under the age of grace and you don't believe in tithing, you should be giving more than 10%, because that would be abundance. Hallelujah. Come on, high five someone say, he's preaching real good right now. A lot of people want to claim that whole grace message because you don't want it. You're being selfish. No, it's, it's the opposite. If you read the Bible, it's the opposite. If you believe in the grace message, you should give more than 10%. What was, now let's go back up to this. Verse number two. Then in a great trial of affliction, he's talking about the churches of Macedonia. In the great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy, verse 2, and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. So what, what was this great trial of affliction? I did some research. What was this great trial of affliction and deep poverty that the churches of Macedonia was facing? Number one, they were going through economic hardships and Roman oppression. Macedonia had been under Roman rule at that time, faced significant economic hardships. After Macedonia became a Roman providence in 146 B.C., it was heavily taxed by the Roman Empire, thus placing a huge financial burden on the people and could have caused widespread, widespread, widespread poverty. Big words there. Now, let me just kind of paint this picture here. Now, what happened was the Roman Empire came in and invaded their land. And because their land was given to the Romans, the Romans had the power to tax the people of that land. Now, let's put it in modern-day terminology here. It would be like this. I'm not saying this is going to happen, but it would be like this. It would be like China coming to the United States, taking over our land, and then having little, small, little 
armies coming to your house, knocking on your door, and getting money from you. That's what it was. China would come in, take away our guns, take over the United States of America, and then heavily tax us. That's what these Christians were going through through the Roman Empire. Aren't you thankful for the United States of America? That right there, they endured more than this, and I'll, I'll talk more about this. I mean, no, we're not near that bad. I mean, we have inflation, but we don't have Chinese or Roman or whoever coming trying to take taxes out of our pockets. See, the region of Macedonia had been affected, also had been affected by wars and conflicts, which also affected the economy and caused financial struggle, struggles of many, many people there. So there was the Roman Empire that was taxing them crazy. And then not only that, but the Christians of this time, they were heavily persecuted. The churches in, in Macedonia, particularly the cities like Thessalonica and Philippi, which we get first and second Thessalonians and the book Philippi, the Philippians, sorry, face persecution for their faith. And we can find that in Acts chapter 16 and 17. New Christians in these cities may have been ostracized socially and economically because of their beliefs, leading to loss of jobs. They didn't have trade, and they lost their property. I mean, oh, that's some really tough times. So when Paul was saying over here again, in their great trial of affliction and the deep poverty, I mean, no, they knew exactly what the churches of Macedonia were going through. I mean, no, they weren't going just through inflation. Come on, somebody. They were going through persecutions. They were going through, I mean, all kinds of crazy things. Not only that, but there was also natural, natural disasters that were taking place. And also just around the local area there, there was challenges. There was crop failures. There was famines. There was natural disasters, kind of like what's going on in Tennessee right now. I mean, and all the things that's going on in our country. I, mean, I, I think it was on CNN that said that, that um, Tennessee's floodings and all that flooding down there is of b- biblical proportions is what CNN said. I mean, we're living in some crazy times. And a lot of you are like getting a little bit nervous right now. Don't get nervous. Stay in faith. Your generosity is what's going to get you through. See, the world wants you to be selfish, but God's way of doing things is to be generous, and I'm going to prove it to you right now, because we don't have it near as bad as the churches in Macedonia had it. So they had natural disasters going on. They had persecutions. They had the Roman Empire coming hard down on, 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 on taxes and all kinds of crazy things. Now look at verse number 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 2. That in their great trial of affliction and the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty, notice this, abounded. Somebody say abounded abounded in the riches of their liberality. The Passion Translation says this, from the depths of their extreme poverty, superabundant joy overflowed into an act of extravagant generosity. Are you kidding me? Yes, that's what the Bible says. So this tells me that churches in Macedonia, Thessalonica Church, Church of Philippi, and all the other little churches there, even though they were persecuted, even though they were highly taxed, guess what? They still gave generously. King David, he gave generously when he had a lot. People that didn't have a lot and was taken away from them, they still gave generously. Why? Because they understood the principles of the kingdom. They understood how to honor God and be obedient. Why? Because the opposite side or the other side of their obedience, supernatural provision is going to take place. That's how God does things. But when the world creeps into our mentality, when the world creeps in even into our heart, and we think save, 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 withhold, 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 and there's nothing wrong with savings, but there's got to be a balance to where it doesn't take away from your generosity. Come on, we should continue to be generous during these times that we're living in. Hallelujah. It's a scriptural principle in the kingdom of God. Their generosity was not determined by their natural circumstances. Their trust and their willingness to honor God was demonstrated by their generosity. It's scriptural to be generous. Hallelujah. Now turn to James chapter 1, verse number 25. James chapter 1, verse 25. As you're turning there, last Sunday I challenged the church to take a week to pray over what they should give in this offering today. His honor his house offering. And I reported to the church that we have a $2.4 million debt that we're going to take care of. And that basically all that debt's the student center and a little bit left that was left here that we put over into one big note when we got the student center. And let me just say about the student center, it's been a huge um, um, blessing to the community. Hallelujah. We've had several um, school events at that at the gym. I mean, it's just 
There's, the list goes on and on. Not only that, but we minister to kids on a daily basis in that student center. So it's not by any means something that you have to look negatively down on because we got that. No, it is a positive thing. It is touching people's lives on a daily basis. And we're doing, we, we can make the payment, all that kind of fun stuff, but we got to do better than that. Amen? amen. I said amen. amen. We, we're going to do more than a $17,000 a month payment. We're going to get this thing paid off. Like I talked about, how did, they, how did they, uh, David kill Goliath? With a rock and a sling. And this debt might seem like Goliath, but how many know all it takes is a rock and a sling? All it takes is our generosity and our words. Because David went out there after Goliath and he said something. He said, I'm going to take you out. I'm going to chop your head. I'm going to take you out. I'm going to take your family out. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to feed you to the birds. Come on. Look at your neighbor and say, we're going, to, we're going to feed debt to the birds. Y'all know what I mean by that? We're not going to allow debt to keep us bound up anymore. In James chapter 1, verse 25, But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, it is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer. Somebody say a doer. A doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. This is kingdom principle, is applying God's word to your life, looking at all the scriptures I just presented to you, the strong scriptural basis for being generous. And choosing, I'm going to be generous, and I'm going to help the church knock this debt out. Can I get an amen? amen? Hallelujah. It is an act of our obedience and honoring him to do that. Why? Because whenever we are doers of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Hallelujah. Now turn to Proverbs chapter 3, verse number 9. Proverbs chapter 3, verse number 9. And I'll solidify it with this scripture, bring it all together, and then we're going we're gonna to pray and we're going to give today. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse number 9, the Bible simply states this, very simple. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase, so your barns would be filled, filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Now, aren't you thankful for God's word? Amen. Aren't you thankful for God's word? Hallelujah. Now, I can look across this place, and I, I'm so blessed to be able to, to see so many amazing people here today and those that are watching online. And um, today's a day, it's a turning point in your life. I don't know how else to say it, just to say it just very, just, just straight. Today's a turning point in your life and in your finances. Um, I believe that as you sow and as you give generously, things are going to shift in your finances today. Yeah. Now, a lot of people might think, well, well you know, it shouldn't be all to be about the finances. It's not all about the finances by any means. It's about generosity. It's about honor. It's not about the money. It's all about honoring him. And this is one of the ways that you honor him. It's by giving of yourself. So honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. Now, let me just kick over some religion here today. Um, do you realize that if you were to study this out in the Gospels, Jesus talked a lot about money. And for me as a, a gospel preacher, as me as a preacher of the gospel and as a pastor, I fear God. And I had to stand before God one day, and I do not want to hear him say, you didn't preach enough on money in the church because you're afraid people get mad. I, I'm not going to stand before God. I'm not going to hear that when I stand before God. Amen. I, I'm going to stand before God with my head held high and say, Lord, I preached your word. I preached the full gospel. And, Lord, what they did with it, that's between them and you. But I preached the gospel. And the gospel is good news. And we're going to break the back of poverty off of this church and off of people's lives. Can I get an amen? It's time, to put, it's time to put the devil on the run. It's time to put Goliath in the grave. It's time to, to, to see God supernaturally move in your finances. And let me just say this. Just as COVID was a word, so was inflation a word. And every knee shall bow to the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. His name's above every name. Just as COVID bows, so does inflation bow in Jesus' name. And I know there might be some people here that might not be necessarily affected by inflation, but there's others that are, just like the churches of Macedonia. But how many know King David wasn't affected by the economy? He, cre he created the economy, you know, through his giving, through his generosity. So whether you're at one end of the spectrum or the, or the other end or in the middle, how many know generosity is something that we all should tap into more? Hallelujah. Amen. So uh, we gave you a whole week to pray about what to give, and I, I committed uh, to the church last Sunday, and um, and um, I, I said that I told the church that I would give two thousand dollars towards this. I'm giving two thousand dollars today. Um, 
praise the Lord, towards getting this debt. Now, what the plan is, is in the future, every fifth Sunday, we're going to take up a special offering on that, and we're going to knock this debt out every fifth Sunday, which was about every quarter or something like that, every fifth Sunday. We're going to knock it. It's going to be called His Honor in His House Offering. How many can stand with us, and let's get this thing done? Hallelujah. Do you realize what $17,000 a month can do if we don't have that payment to help people? Oh, my goodness. It would help missions. It would help locally. It would, it would, there's, just so, there's just so much. Hallelujah. Amen. Are y'all ready to give today? This is what I want to do. If the host team would come down, I want to do something a little bit different today. We used to do this all the time in that other building. And um, we're going we're gonna, to um, just pray. If you just sit them down there, yeah. And if you feel led to come up here and give, man, just come on. Just come on and give. But um, let me pray over that. And let's just pray. Oh, Stephanie. You want to give online we did mark it honor his house so you can look at that and do that as well awesome so online is giving there hallelujah let's pray father in the mighty name of jesus what an honor it is to be able to give into your kingdom today so father we thank you right now as we choose to give we give not grudgingly nor of necessity we give cheerfully today father knowing that you're a god that always provides for all of our needs so, Father, I am so grateful. We're so grateful today, Lord, that you're going to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ever ask or think according to the power that works inside of us. So, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, we ask that you would just bless this, Lord, just like at times of old and even times of today, that as we choose to be generous, Father, we thank you, Lord, for just the opportunity to give into your house in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. If you want to come and give, you can give right now. John, can we do Worthy? Can you go ahead and start playing that for me and I'll sing it? Hallelujah. And if you don't want to come up, you don't have to. You can give um, on the app and all that. Hallelujah. Just start with the chorus. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You can stand to your feet. Worthy is your name. Praise, worthy is your name. Worthy is the name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy, speak it up a little bit. Worthy is your name, Jesus. Come on, let's worship Him. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name, worthy is your name, Jesus, you deserve praise, worthy is, worthy is your name, worthy is your name, Jesus, you deserve praise, worthy is your name. Worthy is your name, Jesus. Deserve the praise. Worthy is your one more time. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name. Jesus, you deserve praise. Worthy is your name. Hallelujah. Worthy is your name. Jesus, you deserve praise. Worthy is your name. Now, worship and generosity go hand in hand. It's it's a, an act of faith all the way around. So when we worship with our lips, we should worship with action also. And generosity is just a, another form of worship. So across this place, let's just worship him again. Let's just lift up our hands and let's just thank him. Hallelujah. You know, just like I said, when David threw that rock with that sling, it was a symbol of our worship. It was a symbol of our words. It was a symbol of our action of generosity. So, Lord, as we've given generously today, Father, 
to eliminate the dead in this church, Father. We now worship you. We water the ground. We water the seed that was sown today, Father. So we worship you. We lift up our voices in this place, and we say thank, thank you, Father, for breaking the back of poverty in the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you for generous people that choose to, to follow after your ways and your kingdom, Father. So, Father, whether it's just five dollars or whether it's thousands, of, it does. In your, it's, as long as it's generous, Lord, that's what you're looking for. So, Father, thank you for a generous heart today, Lord. We give you praise and glory and honor. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We worship you. We worship you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. John is going to be exalted. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Be exalted. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. Your name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name of... Sing it again. Be exalted. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. Your name is all worthy. Jesus, you deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name. Jesus, you deserve the praise. Worthy is you. Grab somebody by the hand today. Hallelujah, Lord. Glory to God. Man, there's just been a shift that just took place. Glory to God. Come on, let's just do this. Let's just, in fact, we're going too fast here. Go ahead and lift up your hands. Let's just give a shout of praise today. Thank you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Breaking the back of poverty in the name. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We're generous. Thank you, Lord. You're good and you're blessing your people, Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. With a shout of praise. With a shout of praise, we thank you, Lord. Hey. Thank you, Lord. Oh, aren't you glad that our voice is better than a clap? As we lift up our hands, our voices are more powerful than a clap. So we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, with the voice of triumph in this place. We're putting the devil on the run. Goliath is defeated. Prosperity. Generosity flowing now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Woo! Hallelujah. Be exalted. Be exalted now in the heavens. Come on. That your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens. As your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name of our sing again. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory to God. Woo. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Thank you, Lord. Woo. One more time, worthy. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is He's worthy. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve it. Worthy is your name. Yeah, now 
right, you can grab somebody by the hand. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, let's pray for one another right now. Come on, pray for the person on your right and on the left right now. Come on. Exercise your faith today. Come in agreement with them. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, Lord. Hallelujah. We refuse to be anxious about things, about our stuff. We refuse to worry about bills being paid. No, we seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. Wisdom is added to us, Lord, how to deal correctly with the finances in our lives. Hallelujah. Not just having more money, but more wisdom. And more wisdom, wisdom in the name of Jesus. Wisdom. Before Solomon got all his wealth, he got wisdom. So, Father, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask. We thank you for your wisdom, Lord. Supernatural wisdom from heaven. Hallelujah. Like Paul prayed for the church at Ephesus that we received the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you, that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you for your wisdom in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. You're so good. You're so good. So, Father, we thank you that there's a turn that just took place. I just see it. There's a turn that just took place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. A turn. In Jesus' name, a turn. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for a turn. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for a turn. James, are you getting anything in the spirit? Yeah, are you getting anything? Daphne, are you getting anything? James? Daphne goes. Actually, while we were up just now, and I, I pictured a few of you coming up here. I know some, you know, didn't have to bring it because you did it online. But, um, but literally what I was hearing was as we were walking our offering up here, we were announcing to the devil what, what shoe size we wear. Like just walking all over his head. So I don't know about you, but I wear size eight and a half. <laughs> and I'm going to keep reminding him. Hallelujah. Well, I was just hearing the Lord say this. He said, He's seen your generosity today. And because he has seen your generosity, now he's going to show you his generosity. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is always good. He never fails. And it doesn't matter where you are today. If you're generous... If you're generous in your heart, God will multiply. Amen? I know there's a lot of people here that gave a large seed today. Death and life are founded upon our tongue. You speak. You speak increase over what you have sowed, and that's speaking in line with faith. You know, the Bible says, it's, I think it's uh, James chapter 2, verse 14, 17, and 24. The Bible says, faith without works is dead. You showed your faith in this seed that you sowed. Don't kill it with your words. Come on, let's lift our hands to heaven one more time. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. There's a turn. Come on, somebody say, I believe. I receive a turn for the better in my finances in Jesus' name. The devil's on the run. He's defeated, and I live in victory. In Jesus' name, I choose to be generous because God always provides for all of my needs, and he always does exceedingly abundantly above all that I could ever ask or think in Jesus name if you believe that shout hallelujah today thank you Lord hallelujah thank you Lord glory to God that's how you have church